Hey, my name's Nigel Kirsten. Um, my talk probably sounds a little more confrontational than I actually meant it to be. Um, I also, the abstract's a little bit misleading because I also thought I had a slightly longer thing, which was my fault. So I've cut out some of the stuff around practical advice around compliance policies and naming various things. Um, hopefully I'm just going to give you some ideas around why I think the word DevOps actually gained a whole bunch of traction and why I think DevSecOps is going so well, but also what some of the pitfalls that I think we're likely to see in the future. So I'm not a security person. I've been lucky enough to work alongside a bunch of really great security people, but my background is very much more in the operations sort of space. So we're generally going to be talking about naming here. And the thing I really wanted to get across was that names carry baggage, sort of unwitting meaning. Well, first thing I would ask, is anyone here who's actually studied linguistics in the crowd? Okay. Excellent. Only one of you. So I, I did a little bit. I was actually a pretty poor linguistics student. It was before I worked out what I actually liked doing at university. But we're going to be covering a few things that I actually really enjoyed and that I found really useful sort of through, I guess, most of my career. So we're going to be talking about naming. And names carry baggage in sort of unwitting ways, not just when we jam together portmanteau words like DevOps and DevSecOps, but even at a much more sort of fundamental level like just the phonemes and the actual shape of sounds that we actually use in words. So if we look at these two shapes, and this is actually a re really repeatable experiment that's been done a whole bunch of different times, and everyone's gotten pretty much the same results to do it. If you look at these two objects, one of them pr is probably going to leap out of you as being more obviously a maluma, and the other is a taketa. Generally, people pick the rounded, sort of curvy object as the one with the rounded sounds, and the one with the sharp sounds, the t and the k, as being the one with the sharp edges. So what I'm trying to get across here is that like words actually carry a whole bunch of meaning, not just from the intrinsic meaning of other components of those words, but just from the actual sort of shapes of those sounds themselves. I think you saw this in Shannon's talk when she was talking about in the DevSecOps world sort of moving away from compliance. If you think about world com word compliance, I think it really encourages a mindset of I'm going to comply with a checklist or a process or a bureaucratic sort of process. It doesn't necessarily mean actually securing a system in a more fundamental way. If you look at Garrett's talk, for those of you who were here yesterday, where he talked about moving towards securing the application and not just the platform, I think these sorts of words are actually starting to change the way we're doing work in security. So, for example, this is a word, Lumigon, and this is a project we just announced yesterday, and that's as close as I'm going to get to actually pitching it. But we've been going around internally when we were building this project, telling people this was the definition. A Lumigon's three-dimensional light occupies in a three-dimensional space inside a contained space. This is a project that has to do with containers. It turns out this isn't actually true at all. But just about everyone believes it, because you've jammed together these words of Lumo from Luminescent and Gon from like Polygon and shapes of objects. You can get pretty plausible kind of lies just by manipulating these sorts of sounds for people. Turns out that we actually use metaphor in a whole bunch of different ways as well. So aside from just the phonemes and the shapes of sounds that we actually use, the different kinds of words that you use in a sentence or describing something actually carry all this unwitting meaning. This is another really repeatable experiment done by the same, same people, and the references are in my slides. If I tell you that I'm driving north through a bunch of hilly terrain next week, and I have to ask you whether you, whether you think I'm generally driving uphill or downhill, most people will say uphill. The problem with doing this sort of thing in front of a crowd, particularly a bunch of sort of skeptical tech folks, is you'll look at this and go, well, you know, I'm going to decompose this whole sentence, and there's obviously no reason why I would think that. But if you actually do this with average people in a normal sort of setting, most people will say that you're generally going uphill. There's nothing in that sentence to indicate that you're actually going uphill. And there's all these different implications there. We get really influenced by the metaphorical relationship between vertical position, and distance. Ridiculous things like this happen. If you ask people to estimate how long it is to travel between two points, if they're going north, they'll say that it's longer than if you're going south. And our brains are kind of imperfect, you know, like we're full of all these sort of cognitive biases, we, you know, civilization's only relatively new, we're all sort of evolved from, you know, making snap judgments about, you know, hunting animals and being hunted by animals. But we get manipulated by this sort of thing in marketing quite a lot. If I say to someone, 
you should go check out this restaurant. It's two blocks south of the railway station. It turns out you're actually more likely to go than if I describe it as being two blocks north of a park, even though they're in exactly the same spot. These sort of things like work on us all of the time. Marketing and advertising kind of know this stuff. You start picking apart these things, you'll notice that you actually get manipulated in this way. We will actually sort of say that we would estimate, if you ask people to do an experiment, they're like, how much will a moving company charge me to move a certain distance? We'll estimate that it costs more to do the same distance going north rather than south, which is sort of ridiculous. Um, this is, it's sort of up for debate because it's a bit hard to A-B test sort of all of human history, whether this is due to the way we generally have maps as with north being up, or whether we generally have maps as north being up because of this same association. So a lot of this stuff comes out of a guy called George Lakoff, who's a linguistics professor. This is a pretty old book, in, written in the late 70s, early 80s, I think. There's been a few different iterations of it. He actually writes a whole bunch of really interesting stuff on politics these days. Um, if you follow US politics at all, he actually predicted Trump would win well before lots and lots of people, um, and has lots of really interesting stuff about the metaphors that the different parties in the US use to describe their own. So this is George Lakoff. But he sort of argues that it's not just that we use metaphor a lot, but that our system of thought is fundamentally metaphorical. And there's a few different aspects to this that are sort of interesting. That metaphors are useful. There's a reason we use them. They allow you to import beliefs and awareness from a certain schema into another one. So when you're trying to understand an unfamiliar domain, we use metaphor to describe it because you can use a short sentence and suddenly people import all of these preconceptions. And there's good and bad aspects to this. <coughs> Generally, we're not aware of how much we actually use metaphor like this, and just how actually foundational it is. Larkoff actually argues that the progression of thought in sort of humans is generally the more and more sophisticated use of metaphor and abstractions. Now, not all linguists agree on this. Most do, um, but there's just wanted to add a footnote there that this isn't exactly you know 100% agreement amongst the academic space. So, have a look at things like this. <coughs> We generally use a whole bunch of metaphors around war to describe arguments. You know, we use strategy, you win an argument, you demolish their argument, you mount a defense. This, the book that's what I find really interesting about it is it tends to unpack and pull out all of these sort of metaphors that we use day to day. Now you sort of think about this, and particularly in sort of Western civilization, this feels really obvious. We're like, yeah, well, arguments are war, but they're not war. No one's actually dying. Not all civilizations and cultures treat arguments like that. There's been sort of lots of interesting research showing that you know, some small tribes actually treat their arguments as being much more like a dance or a creative endeavor where two people are interacting to produce something, which is a fundamentally different metaphor to argument being war. One that I think is really interesting is that we particularly think of time as money. You know, we invest time, we borrow time, we save time. But time's not money. Like, it's not actually anything like that. I can't sit there and deposit my time an account somewhere, wait for it to grow and then pull it back again. They're actually not the same thing at all. When you look at how many different ways we actually use things, we talk about having time to spare and borrowing time. So what I'm trying to get to here, because this is probably starting to feel a little bit like field, is that the words we use actually change the way we behave, and they change what we think are the range of possible actions when we do stuff. So why should we think? Well, we work with computers. Computing is just full of metaphors and abstractions. We do this all of the time, and we do it for good reasons. Uh, one of the interesting things about computing is it's one of the few spaces where we invent things, and then we invent the actual metaphors to describe them. Some of them become dead metaphors. Um, any of you, you know, we're probably hitting the point now where there's people in the crowd who they don't immediately think of looking at a floppy disk icon and thinking of it as a floppy disk. But it sort of becomes safe in general for a lot of software. We use them all of the time. We generally make abstractions to hide complexity. And we do this for good reason, because abstractions let us simplify a problem space. We use metaphors to describe them, and it pulls all of that awareness into that space and lets us work more quickly with it. I think a really good example here is the difference between containers, zones, and jails. So I don't know if we have any FreeBSD or BSD or Solaris folks in the crowd. Probably gotten sick of going. We've had containers for ages. Um, I know I've definitely had a whole bunch of people like that in my team. But I actually think the word container was a big reason why they took off so 
it's not just that you know Linux is a much bigger platform than a lot of those platforms. The container carries with it a whole bunch of meaning that a zone or a jail doesn't. It's a standardized packaging unit. You can hand it to someone else. You, know, you can fill a ship full of them and move them somewhere. This isn't something you can actually do with the abstract concept of a zone or a jail. You, know, you think about a jail and how did most people use them? They used them to actually sort of capture something and protect it and sort of restrict access. Containers, in many ways, people were using, you know, for portability. That sort of suddenly became where the whole tool chain was actually progressing. And before I go much further on this, I don't know how many of you have read this blog, but Jez France actually has a really great post on why containers are not actually like zones or jails. And I actually think this serves my purpose, the point I'm trying to make it even more strongly. Containers aren't actually a thing, if you think about it. It's actually sort of this label we've whacked, whacked around, you know, C groups and process namespaces and various things in the kernel. Um, whereas zones and VMs and jails are actually designed as a unit that you couldn't sort of pull apart. I think this has actually meant that containers have had a whole bunch of more advancement technically than the other those other projects. But this is a really great post that's totally worth checking out. And all we do in the automation space is build more and more abstractions on top of things. Just think about you know bare metal. To VMs, to PaaS, infrastructure as a serverless service, serverless functions, cloud functions, all of this stuff, we're just getting higher and higher levels of abstractions. And we're just going to keep creating more of them. There's going to be lots and lots of them. And I'm essentially arguing you can't hurt us to think a little more deliberately about the things we do here. Now, the reason why I'm sort of getting to this whole point, okay, um, I was around. I was lucky enough to be sort of around during a lot of the sort of early days of DevOps. I work at a software vendor that did an awful lot of marketing around DevOps, so I'm not pretending to be particularly pure here. But I've been really deeply involved with sort of DevOps adoption in the enterprise space. And I've seen some of the sort of bastardization and distortion of sort of some of that internal, that original meaning happening, not just vendor driven, but just by people who work in this space. And I think there's a few different things about the words themselves that have caused DevOps to both gain heaps of traction but then sort of start heading off in some pretty screwy directions recently. And I'm essentially arguing that DevSecOps, in many ways, has some of those potential pitfalls ahead of it as well. So why did DevOps become such a big deal? I think there's a few things. When you're an operations person, honestly, your interaction with development was the worst part of your job, particularly if you're at a company that builds software or even built sort of just business applications for the platforms you run. You know, traditional things, you probably all heard before, you know, huffing things over the wall, you couldn't fix the bug with the thing that was actually wrong at 3 a.m. But you also had a pretty manual process for most of your stuff. I think it took the rise of things like infrastructure as code, actual APIs on cloud services, actual progression of programming languages, you know. We never thought of ourselves as programmers, yet we build these ridiculously complicated shell scripts and do all of this stuff around Bash, which is actually a pretty crap programming environment in many ways. But then we had Perl, Python, Ruby, all of these things appeared and let us actually have pretty accessible languages that could interact with simple APIs that weren't XML RPC. You know, there were REST APIs, you could get to them really easily and interact with them. But I think also the reason ops people wanted to become DevOps people is your developers generally had a higher status in your organization. Just being an ops person, you know, maintaining the status quo, I think it really colored the way we thought of our jobs, whereas development, it's actually fun, you get to build things, you do stuff, you get paid more, generally. Before DevOps appeared as a title, we had Agile, and there was Agile system administration. Like, I think I'm still on the mailing list that gets like a message once every six months. But that was where many of the same people, like Patrick Dubois, were doing stuff, but that label didn't really stick until the DevOps label came out. So I think there were lots of reasons for people to jump onto that new game. I'd argue the Agile manifesto and consultants jumping on it so quickly really became a bit of a problem for them. It was a different kind of a manifesto, but I think we saw that get co-opted pretty badly. Honestly, though, I think the big reason it started accelerating once a small group of people started getting really excited about it is it becomes a tribal signifier. And the word's kind of meaningless. It's like the emo haircut. You see another kid like that, and you're like, you know, they're not like the other kids, they're more like me. People start using the term DevOps to go, we actually want to work in a different way. And I think that's what we're seeing with DevSecOps. Like, it's a fundamental shift. You're moving away from just validating checklists in production to moving left in the pipeline, being part of the design, absorbing software engineering principles, but it doesn't mean you actually have to be a developer, so to speak. 
I think this is one of the big misconceptions and the problems with the name DevOps was that lots of people went, I can't become a developer. I've been working in operations for 20 years. All I write are thousand line bash scripts. And you're like, well, no, you just need to absorb software engineering. And I'd argue much it's the same case for DevSecOps. You're not necessarily having to be a software architect and build these huge enterprise applications. You need to understand what development involves, version control, peer review. You need to understand how to work like a developer. And you need to have development skills. But I'm going to argue that pretty much everyone in all of technology is going to have to have development skills as we go on. But there's unintended naming consequences. And this is where I'm sort of going with this. I don't know how many of you know about the amazing story of the Nissan Pajero when they went to sell it in Spain. Apparently, and I don't speak Spanish, Pajero means wanker or tosser. Um, there's been a few different cases like this. Um, this is the most safe for work one I could actually come up with. Um, but have a look at the hilarious story of the Nissan Pajero. So here are some of the misunderstandings I think we got. We get developers going, well, DevOps for me means I don't need an ops person anymore. I can do all of that job as a developer. And then you get the two different kinds of fear. You get to go, woo, I get to do development as an operations person. Or, crap, I need to actually become a software developer. And that's not necessarily true. Here are some of the misconceptions ones we see. Um, Matthew Skelton has a really great blog out there called DevOps Topologies that has both positive patterns and anti-patterns for DevOps groups. This is one of the worst ones I've seen. And we're seeing this across enterprises all over the place. And before it makes it, I sound like I'm just saying this, this is a vendor's problem, I don't think it is. I think it's people on the ground sort of not really taking time to understand. If you look through you know, Helen's talk yesterday about the emergence of DevOps, there are these really important aspects of culture and sharing, and it's not just about measurement and automation. I die a little inside every time I see someone going, and Reddit's a pretty great example of this. If you go to the DevOps subreddit, it's a really great idea, a great place to find out why people are actually using stuff on the ground. People going, well, now I'm a DevOps because I'm using Jenkins. You know, it's never been about using one tool. And I say this as someone who works at a software company, this, you're never doing DevOps if you've just adopted a different tool chain. And you're certainly not doing it if you're just the, in the part of the company that's taking software and moving it over the wall to operations. I literally, and I'm not making this story up, I was at Microsoft Build two years ago and I had someone come up to me and go, we built a DevOps team and now we're having the same problems we were having before, but between the dev team and the DevOps team and between the DevOps team and the ops team. And I think I was, I don't think I was jet lagged, but I may have been a little kind of shrunk from lack of sleep. And I was like, well, clearly what you need to do is make a dev DevOps team. <laughs> and the guy walked away before I could actually say anything else. And so I have this horrible fear that someone out there is going down this infinite recursion path. This is the other dysfunction I think we see. These are not the only two anti-patterns. Like, Matthew's blog's really great, because he has full descriptions of all this stuff and why it works and why it doesn't work. But this is one we see a lot. There's a group of developers who go, well, we're going to do DevOps, and we're still going to follow the mindset of huffing things over the wall. We're not going to wear the pager. We're not going to share responsibility. We're not going to invite operations expertise into the development process. And I think this is one of my big worries about the DevSecOps space, that we're going to start following some of these things. These are the worst ones I see. You get developers going, well, we're never going to need operations. For those who are around when you know, Netflix started pushing the whole no-ops movement, what they were saying made lots of sense. You know, these were smart people who built a really, really great system, and they didn't have dedicated ops teams. But I think the fact they called it no-ops meant that everyone in the operation space was just like, what? I'm not joining this movement that means I don't exist anymore. So I don't think it gained an awful lot of traction, but we're starting to see DevOps, I think, in the enterprise, people going, well, we don't need operations people. We can just do all of it ourselves. And I just don't think that's practical. There's certain expertise that comes from actually maintaining stuff in production, no matter whether there's a server involved, no matter whether you're actually, you know, if you're dealing entirely with cloud functions, there's still expertise in what it takes to actually maintain stuff in production. And if you're a developer who's absorbing those lessons and actually working in that way, that's great. But if you're going to ignore the whole expertise of the operation space, I think you're in a disaster space. The thing that's been frustrating me, I think, the most has been seeing the number of, sort of particularly really tiny vendors who were selling agile software, boards, agile something or other, and just literally rebadging everything DevOps. Start to use it as a noun, you know, like now you are a DevOps, you can use the DevOps to do your DevOps. It gets sort of ridiculous, and there's no actual sort of authenticity there around what it is you're actually trying to achieve. I think, honestly, you could do much worse than go back to what Helen was saying with that definition. Culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. And then Jez's 
addition that he threw in later, L for Lean. Because I think Lean Product Management and Lean Enterprise is a really big part of how all of this works. So this is the worry I think we're, we might have. I'm not talking about the people who are doing this authentically, who are actually going, look, we're going to take security work, we're going to focus on making things more secure, we're going to secure the application, we're going to work alongside the developers. But I'm a little worried that we're going to see in enterprises, just as we've seen dysfunctional patterns for DevOps, that we might see dysfunctional patterns for DevSecOps. And I don't really think we should dig the hole all that much deeper. I think we should be kind of aware of it. It's currently a tribal signifier. There's huge traction. We've got a whole track here. You know, we've got people talking about it. We've got people excited about it. And all of this is fantastic. There's, I think one of the things that I've been really proud of is that I got to work alongside security people who were doing this before. And this is something we heard in, when DevOps happened. Lots of people were like, why would we rename a thing? This is already how a good ops person works. But names actually matter. And the fact that there's actually a movement around this, and the fact that people are actually doing stuff is great. It's really, really awesome. You're getting rapid traction because there's a convenient label. We get to import all of the menopause from a previous space. But we have been seeing problems in the DevOps space around this. In some ways, I think it was sort of an unfortunate name. Um, I think it was unfortunate in a way because DevOps, I think, is a much bigger mindset than just development and operations. I think a few people yesterday used the term sort of, you know, business operations or application ops. There's a much wider sense in which we could have taken things but too many people, I think, have gone, well, DevOps just means development and operations. And it can mean much, much more than that. And this is not me bagging out any of the vendors who are actually here. Because most of the people who are here are actually doing real work in work, doing security in a fundamentally different way. But I think the moment we start seeing people who are actually creating separate DevSecOps teams that are entirely isolated organizationally from the rest of the company, that's not going to be a great way to work. And as soon as we start, like, this is where I think you need to be sort of defensive. And we saw a real split in the DevOps community between the folks who are around DevOps days to people who were starting to sell stuff that was honestly pretty much snake oil. That being said, we've got a lot of really great people in the DevOps space doing the DevOps Enterprise Summit. And I think DevOps Enterprise has been a really great sort of sub-movement of its own because enterprises do have a fundamentally different way of working. So the big warning signs, I think, are going to be separate DevSecOps teams, when you start seeing vendors rebadging software that is honestly an old way of working and just calling it DevSecOps. And when you start seeing people talking about going, well, we don't need security people anymore because developers can just do that job. No matter how much you actually automate things, no matter how much sophisticated software gets, you're going to need the expertise of humans doing that. And just like in the operations space, sure, maybe it's not as important anymore for everyone to understand pixie booting, booting bare metal machines, like actually racking and stacking stuff. But operations expertise continues to be really, really important. I think that's where we're going with the actual DevSecOps movement. People are going to have to absorb security principles. And maybe there's a world in the future where we're all just different flavors of developers, uh, and we start leaving all of these labels behind. But we're not there yet. 